<clears throat> Just a few weeks ago, I went to a graduation service at Salisbury University. A dear friend was graduating after many, many years of study, the master's degree in social work, and we wanted to be there for her, but the problem was we had to be there for everyone else too. Hundreds of people graduating, hundreds of names to sit through. People we didn't know, people would walk across the stage, get their diploma. Some would say, some did this. One guy uh, did some moves that I really couldn't decipher. And then at the end of his moves, he went down and did a splits all the way down to the floor, and it looked painful. <laughs> I didn't get that. My friend Crystal got her diploma, and we all stood up and screamed, and even though they had told us at the beginning to save your celebration till the end, no one paid attention to that. <clears throat> It was toward the end of the graduation, though, that one graduate walked across the stage. I noticed his name sounded Arabic to me. And as he walked across the stage, his name was announced, and he pulled out from underneath his robe a folded flag and unfurled it. And I thought to myself first, I said, well, it's his national flag. And then as I looked at the flag, I realized that this was more than just being proud of his country. It was a Palestinian flag. And this was his protest, because this was already after the beginning of the war between Israel and Palestine. And so this was his protest, and his family up on the higher level was also waving a Palestinian flag and, 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 and screaming and yelling. And he walked across the stage with his Palestinian flag unfurled. The president of the university did not have a smile on her face. You could tell that uh, she was not pleased. <clears throat> I thought to myself, this is an inappropriate time and space for such a protest. And then I thought to myself, how thankful I am to live in a country where he could do that. Amen. And express his choice, his freedom of speech at that graduation service. He, he got his diploma, went down and and as all the graduates had, paraded around the floor and came back to his seat. How glad I am to live in a country where he can express his beliefs, even if I don't think it was appropriate at that time and space. Liberty, and especially religious liberty we embrace it, we guard it, we cherish it, we count on it. We have to be constantly vigilant to stand up for it. By the way, do you notice the picture on the screen? It's by Nathan Green. Do any of you know that that picture is in our foyer? How many of you know that that picture is hanging on the wall right outside those doors? It expresses the Atholton Church to me. A family of God, of all hues, of all places around the world. We love religious liberty. There are limits to religious freedom, rightfully so. There are old pagan religions that are still in, 
in principle practiced today, even in America, but you know, in the ancient times, those pagan religions practiced human sacrifice. <laughs> and we don't have that today. We have limitations on all religious practices. We have limitations on religious liberty and on liberty in general. Someone has said that your liberty ends at the tip of my nose. In other words, you're free to come that far, but no further. There are limits to our freedoms and our religious liberty. Religious liberty must be for all or it will become for none. Seventh-day Adventists have always been interested in religious liberty, I think primarily because of the Sabbath. But even beyond the Sabbath, we should be interested in it. Religious liberty is about so much more than the Sabbath and our fear of Sunday legislation. You know, Jesus believed in religious liberty. God believes in religious liberty. God gave men and women when he created them. He gave the angels of heaven when he created them freedom of choice, free will. He has not forced us. We are not robots or automatons. God believes in free will, in religious liberty. So we believe in it too. I'm sure many of you know this quotation that was by a German pastor, theologian during the Second World War. His name is Martin Niemöller. He writes about the time during the Second World War and about his opposition to the Nazi regime. He writes this of that time. He says, first they came for the communists, and I did not speak out because I was not a communist. Then they came for the socialists, and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists, and I did not speak out because I was not a, train union, a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. And then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak out for me. That's why we must be concerned about not just our own religious freedoms, and freedoms in general, but the freedoms of all around us. And we have to look at the bigger picture of liberty and religious liberty especially. Now here's the problem. Here's the problem of religious liberty. Religious freedom and freedom of speech protects a whole lot of really wacky things. Things that I frankly find repulsive. And they're protected just as my perfect center of the road theological beliefs are protected. And I expect mine to be. But some of them are offensive. But to protect them is necessary because not to protect everyone's religious freedoms is horrible and it's also offensive. But there are so many differing, opposing religious views. And unfortunately, those re religious views sometimes polarize us. They polarize us in general in many different camps. You know, when you look at the very basic uh, view of religious liberty, some people believe in God and some people don't. And you know, those who don't believe in God, atheists, let's say. Atheists also have religious liberty. Think about that. 
They depend upon it as much as I depend upon it, even though they don't have religion. They're practicing their religious liberty. With polarization can come conflict and anger and opposition. My side, your side. And what I'd like to ask the question with the rest of the time I have is how do we deal with those conflicts? How do we deal with people that don't see it like I do? You know, there's an interesting story of religious intolerance in Scripture. Probably many more than one, but this one, there's two of them here back to back in Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9, verses 49 through 50. Luke chapter 9, 49 through 50. Jesus is speaking with his, with his disciples, and John says, Master, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he does not follow with us. You see the issue? Someone is casting out the name demons in the name of Jesus, and evidently successfully, understand that. And John says, we tried to stop him, because he does not follow with us. He is not part of our group. He doesn't believe like we believe. He doesn't agree with us. So therefore, we can't allow him to do the things that we're doing in your name. And what's Jesus' response? Verse 50. And Jesus said to him, Do not stop him, for the one who is not against you is for you. Very, very interesting encompassing view of Jesus. Don't stop him. If he's doing a work that's similar to ours, embrace him. Because you have more in common than you have different. I've, I've found it interesting through the years that I, I hear, I, I talk to people about books they're reading, and I'll, I'll have someone tell me that you're reading this book, and they're really being blessed by it. And then they say this to me, they say, well, it's not an Adventist author. I want to say, so? <laughs> it's as though only Adventist authors can write good books. You know, if you were blessed by reading the book, then God used the book to bless you. It doesn't matter. It, Jesus says it right here. If he's not against you, he's for you. Continues on another story. The same setting, and I think Jesus is trying to teach us something here, and Luke is trying to teach us something here. Verse 51, when the days drew near for him to be taken up. Now this is when Jesus is going up to Jerusalem to be, to be crucified. When the days come near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem, and he sent messengers ahead of him who went and entered a village of the Samaritans to make preparations for him. But the people did not receive him because his face was set toward Jerusalem. You know, the Jews and the Samaritans were not friends. They hated each other. They were rivals. They were half-brothers. But they, the Jews considered the Samaritans to be half-breeds. And there was not good relations between them. And so when Jesus is proposing to go through the Samaritan territory, the Samaritans say, we don't want that guy here because he's on his way to Jerusalem. You get the picture? Verse number 54. And when his disciples, James and John, saw it, they said, this is amazing. They said, Lord, do you want us to tell fire to come down from heaven and consume them? Huh? Really? And he turned and rebuked them. And they went on to another village. And as they were going along the road, someone said to him, it's, uh, that's, that's all there, tell fire to come down from heaven and consume them because they slighted Jesus. Religious intolerance. 
So I ask this question. Is there a principle we can use to help us navigate our relationships with people who disagree with us in the religious realm? Is there a principle we can use to help navigate our relationships with people who oppose us or who stand in our way or who say bad things about us or who understand the Bible differently than we do, who practice their religion differently or go to church on a different day, the wrong day? How do we deal with them? How do we approach them? And how do we maintain our own principles, and yet, how do we treat them? And as simple as it may sound, there is a principle. And Jesus gave it to us. And it's in Matthew chapter 7, verse 12. It is a principle that you all have heard of. It's called the golden rule. I call it a rule of gold in a world of lead. Matthew chapter 7, verse 12, Jesus says, So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for, for this is the law and the prophets. Whatever you would like someone to do to you, do to them. How would you like to be treated, Jesus says? Treat other people in that same way. It governs our relationships in general. But let me suggest to you that it really helps govern the relationships with people who we don't agree with, that we disagree with. And let, me, let me suggest to you that if we would treat every person with this golden rule, it would be the greatest evangelistic principle of all time. Much better than prophecy seminars. Much better than Bible studies in their homes. If we treated every person with the kindness, love, acceptance, hospitality, that that we would like to be treated with, the kind of, of relationship that Jesus, the way Jesus treats us, it would be a wonderful evangelistic principle. We treat people with the love of Jesus because isn't that the way you would like to be treated? Now let me, let me tell you, this, this saying of Jesus was radical. It's in all the history of the world with all the philosophers, He's the only one who had said this. However you would like to be treated, however you would like to be treated, treat others like that. Now there were many ancient philosophers who said something similar only from the opposite point of view. In Judaism, the Talmud, a sacred writing of the Jews, said it like this, what is hateful to you, do not do to your fellow man. But there's a difference. Uh, Buddhism predates Christianity. Uh, the uh, Buddhists say, hurt, no, hurt not others in ways that you yourself find hurtful. Confucius, do not do to another that you would not like to have them do to you. The Stoics, the Greek philosophers, what you do not wish to be done to yourself do not do to any other. If you study the ancient philosophies, there are about 10 ancient philosophies that say this rule in a negative way. If you don't want something done to you, don't do it to someone else. It's a negative way of doing it. But Jesus takes this negative and turns it on an ear and makes it a positive. It doesn't just keep us from doing bad things to people. It tells us we should do good things to people. We shouldn't plot not how to hurt them. We should plot how to be kind to them and how to do loving things to them. It's a completely different principle. Jesus is his positive. Do this. Positive action is required, not inaction. And it transforms it. 
Unfortunately, there are other principles of the golden, other versions, other renditions of the golden rule that are around today. I'd say probably the most common rendition of the golden rule today is do unto others as they do unto you. Right? However someone treats you, you treat them back. This is the natural response. If someone's kind to you, you'll probably be kind to them. Someone pokes you in the eye, you're going to want to poke them back in the eye. Tit for tat. Natural response. You treat me good, I'll treat you bad. You hit me, I'll hit you back. And then you take this to the extreme. You hit me, and I'll hit you back ten times worse. That's really the principle of today's world. You see it right now, all around the world. The wars that are going on. You hit me, I'm going to strike you back a crippling blow. Do unto others as they do to you. Jesus says no. Here's another rendition that's common in our world today. Do unto others before they get the chance to do to you. This is a business principle. If you see a competitor starting to prosper, you do something to undercut them and run them out of business before they can take your business. Proactive. Aggressive. This is the golden rule. He who has the gold rules. It's the truth. It's the business principles of today. Another rendition that's common. Do unto others, but don't get caught. It's a criminal mentality. Identity theft. Think about it. That's the identity theft principle. The criminal idea. Do unto others, just don't get caught. Of course, there's the other golden rule. We call it mama's golden rule. If mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. <clears throat> but Jesus transcends them all. Plot to do good things to people. Not plot to do bad things to people. Make people glad that they know you instead of sad that they know you. And here's the interesting thing. I think we should treat all people this way. But the Bible in Luke suggests that this is not primarily for people that we like. This is how we should pe treat people we don't like. In, in Luke chapter 6, we have the parallel saying, you know, oftentimes Matthew, Mark, and Luke have similar sayings. <clears throat> and the, the telling of the golden rule in Luke's, is in Luke 6.31. Luke 6.31. It says this, And as you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. Same principle, right? The golden rule. But the context is different in the telling in Luke than it is in Matthew. Jump up to verse 27 of Luke 6. But I say to you, those, but I say to you who hear, Jesus talking here, love your enemies. Notice the context of the golden rule is in the context of how you treat your enemies, how you treat people you disagree with. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Really? Pray for those who abuse you. To one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic also. 
Give to everyone who begs from you and from one who takes away your goods. Do not demand them back as you wish that others would do to you. Do so to them. You see, this golden rule principle is not telling us how we should treat people that we agree with, although we should. It's teaching us how to deal with people we disagree with, which makes it even harder, doesn't it? From a normal human point of view, how do we do that? I don't. It's only Christ living in me that can possibly accomplish that. It's only the indwelling of the Holy Spirit that can possibly help us to treat people we disagree with in this way. As I've been watching, as I've been watching what's going on in society today, and specifically the Adventist Church. I've seen some places lately that I really wish we were practicing the golden rule better. This is one of those days when your pastor really becomes frank with you. I'm preaching from my heart today, folks. Things that I see that are happening in the church that I say, we need some more golden golden rule principle in our relationships, in the church, and with other people. I long to see the love of Jesus being manifested between brothers and sisters in the church and to our friends outside the church. I long to see some of the judgmentalism that has sometimes characterized Adventism fall away. Sometimes I see the same polarization happening in the church that we see in society, and it makes me sad because sometimes I hear the same same rhetoric inside the church that we hear in politics outside the church, and I think it's wrong. Sometimes we can be judgmental as a people and our love of truth can make us as Seventh-day Adventists sometimes come across as having a superiority complex. However, if you'd like to practice the golden rule, then those that we disagree with We need to treat them like we would want to be treated. And as as I've been thinking about how I wanted to share this with you this morning and share from my heart and, and not be offensive, I've struggled with this a lot. I see some groups that we as a church have been challenged to practice the golden rule with. We have been golden rule challenged as a church. One challenge I've seen recently in the church is the way we treat each other in the church when we disagree with each other theologically. There are, let's let's, let's be honest, there are different ways of looking at things in the Adventist church. Some people are in favor of these ideas. Some are in favor of those. I'm not going to be extremely specific in what I see as some of the things that are dividing the church, but most of you know what they are. And I see some of the conversations that happen online on on independent Adventist, independent Adventist, new sources and I see the way some people write against the conservatives in the church and I see the way some of the conservatives in the church write against those who are more liberal in the church and I see some of the names they call each other and some of the accusations they make and I say there's no golden principle rule in this writing it's not 
there. It's not there. There are debates that happen recently at the fall council and at the general conference that that um, made me worried. It, it didn't seem, it didn't feel to me like there was golden rule principles being adhered to in some of the conversations that I heard online. Listen, it doesn't matter which group you identify with in the church, conservative, progressive, liberal, we all have to treat each other like Jesus would treat us. We have to treat each other with that golden principle rule. There's more, Jesus said, there's more that, there's more that unites us than divides us. And Satan wants to use those things that divide us to sidetrack us from our mission. And that is to tell the world that Jesus is coming again. I call for more golden rule principles in our discussions as a people, as church family, as people in our church. Jesus, since I, since I love the truth and since I love Jesus, I want to ask this question. How can I treat someone who loves Jesus but does not understand the 28 fundamental beliefs exactly as I do? How can I treat them? And it's with the golden rule. Another group that I think we as Adventists have been golden rule challenged with is um, non-Adventists. And some of the words we've used to describe non-Adventists and especially Sunday keepers, I don't think we've, we've practiced the golden rule. Some of the things we've said about them is very judgmental and unkind. Sometimes we've been brutal to Roman Catholics and to the Pope and I obviously don't believe in the Pope or I wouldn't be married and a Seventh-day Adventist minister. But here's the question. How can someone who loves Jesus see the Sabbath differently as I do? How can they? And sometimes we as Seventh-day Adventists say, well, there's, it's, so, it's so plain, how can they possibly do that? So therefore, they can't love Jesus as I do. Well, would you like to be treated that way? The golden principle rule says that whatever people believe, they have the right to believe that. Religious liberty says they have the right to believe that. And those who believe differently than we do, we should treat with respect and kindness and give them the freedom that we demand ourselves. Now, I'm not saying that I don't believe in teaching the truth. I believe in evangelism. I believe in standing up for what God has revealed in truth to the Seventh-day Adventist Church. But perhaps people will fall in love with Jesus with less judgment. Perhaps. Not my, I want them to see the beautiful Jesus not my judgmental attitude. The third group may be sensitive to share this morning, but I want to share it with you. I believe the third group that we as Adventists have been challenged, especially recently by, is the LGBTQ plus community. How do we as Seventh-day Adventists respond to them? We've acted for years like they didn't exist in Adventism, but they do. And over the last few years, we've come to have to understand how do we respond to them in the Adventist church? And I will tell you with the golden rule. It applies to our relationships with the LGBTQ plus community. Now I have to tell you, as I read the Bible, I believe that the Bible teaches that marriage is between one man and one woman. 
I believe in monogamy. I believe in fidelity. I don't see any other way to interpret the Bible. But I also believe that when dealing with people who do not accept that teaching of the Bible and believe in the relationships represented in the LGBTQ plus community, they have the same freedom to pursue those relationships and yet be treated with the golden rule as Christians should treat everyone and they should be treated with respect, acceptance, kindness, hospitality, as if there is no difference between them and someone else. To do differently would be to treat them in an unchristlike manner. You know, when you put it all down to the bottom line, it is not the test of our Christianity as to how we treat people who agree with us. The test of our Christianity is how we treat those who disagree with us. And Jesus said, they will know you are Christians by your love. Amen. And maybe that's what the golden rule is all about. You know, I hear people sometimes use this phrase when, when talking about other people of other different groups, whether it be one of the three I've identified or any other group. Yeah, we should treat them with love, kindness, and respect, but and usually the but is followed by some way to qualify treating them with love, kindness, respect, and hospitality. You understand what I mean? No buts. No buts in treating people with the golden rule. There is no buts. We should treat people with kindness, respect, love, hospitality should treat people like we would like to be treated, period. I thought I knew this passage pretty well, but I discovered something in preparing for this sermon. The end of the golden rule. We only quote the first half. Back to Matthew 7. Back to Matthew 7. Verse 12, so whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them. We usually quit reading there, but look what it says. For this is the law and the prophets. This is the law and the prophets. What's that phrase mean? It means it summarizes the whole Old Testament, the law and the prophets. This is another law. And I got to thinking, what a shame it would be to those who love the 10 if we broke the 11th. What would a shame it would be. This parallels the Matthew 22, 37 through 40, in which someone asked Jesus, what's the great commandment? And remember, Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and your soul and your mind. And the second is like unto it, love your neighbor as yourself. And then Jesus says, upon these two hang all the law and prophets. This is a summary of everything we should do, whatever however you would like to be treated, treat someone else like that. Okay, let's see if you've been paying attention. Repeat after me. Do unto others as you would have them do to you. There's an American poet whose name was Edwin Markham. Edwin Markham. He died about 1940. 
he said this. He said, we have committed the golden rule to memory. Let us now commit it to life. Please come and sing with us. I've chosen this song, I think. I've chosen this song even knowing, knowing that probably one of you will know it. But I love the words to this song so much. And it, it kind of uh, envisions for me the, the kind of church the church would be if we follow the golden rule. Let's stand together, please, with me and, and sing it. And even though you won't know the, word, the, the, the words very well and the tune, pay attention to the words, please. 